So oftentimes when we talk about the subject women in the Bible, we think of a wife of this or a daughter of that. Are there any different stories of warriors that we just we don't see within just the domestic sphere? Something with more, I don't know, oomph. I mean, like, are they, they're not all like barefoot and pregnant right. in the kitchen. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, there's two sides of that because uh, it's really interesting how oftentimes uh, female characters that are super important for the unfolding of a story will rena- remain completely unnamed in the story yeah. itself. There's a character in Judges, Batiftach, the daughter of Jephthah, and oh, that's, that's a ha- terrible story, right? Is, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, and it's actually really, um, it's interesting that she remains unnamed because she is a subject of sacrifice. She becomes sacrificed essentially by her father, Jephthah. And her um, body parts are sent to different yeah. households. Or, okay. I mean, it's, it's just a crazy, crazy story because it's all her father's fault and she's the one who suffers. So that would be sort of like, you know, the assumption of like all of the like female biblical characters in a kind of patriarchal system must be either totally without agency or their agency is covert, right? And so I'm thinking about like in the case of like Rebecca, right? Who's trying to get Jacob the birthright instead of Esau, right? The, the, the last blessing right. before Isaac dies. Isaac's on his deathbed. He has, he's going to He's going to give his final blessing, which is the blessing of patria potestas, right? The, you know, the, the father, the paternal authority. And it's, it's got to be to the firstborn. But Rebecca doesn't want it to be that way. Um, and so she works through covert power, right, to make it, you know, in this sort of tricky way. So, you know, you go out and, and get the, you know, dress up yeah. like your brother and smell like your brother and put the skins on your hands so you feel she's like... She's the one who cooks, right? Yeah, she's the one it's who cooks. Interesting, yeah. Which is, you know, not what the, you know, this is... It's funny because she's actually giving orders to Jacob, yeah. which are running counter to the commands that Isaac is give, giving Esau, right? Go out into the fields, hunt me some game, cook a meal for me such as I like, yeah. right? That he's supposed to go through this ritual of this final meal with his father so that then he can give this like final like blessing of his innermost self, right? His nephesh, his innermost self. Um, so we think that, you know, we, I think we often think that being really familiar with these kinds of stories, that this is how feminine power works, right? That it's um, covert. But we actually have other kinds of stories. We have warriors. Mm-hmm. Funnily enough, um, the ones who are doing the dirty work don't don't actually seem to be um, necessarily Israelites. <laughs> but what do you just, mean by dirty work? Okay, so I was taking like, the, the the figure of Yael. Okay, right? um, and this is another kind of like animal or botanical metaphor. So I talked a little bit about Tamar, the date palm, and a Yael is an ibex. Which is like an eye back, really? okay, right? right? With the horns that go back like that, right? Just like something that's gonna like gore you from the back. <laughs> <laughs> just like that, that's that's what I mean, nice and different. That's always like the image yeah. that I have is like it's just gonna like it's gonna like yeah. stab you from the back, um, which is essentially what Yael does, right? I mean, there is a sense of covertness here too because she's so she's not Israelite. She's um, married to Hever the Kenite, but she's you know. It's a sort of tribe that lived in proximity with the Israelites, and so it's sort of like Israelite adjacent, right? Helpful? Right, yes. Helpful foreigner, I right. guess you might right. say. Model minority. <laughs> yes. That might be a good article, okay. actually. Yes. <laughs> but in any case, so she brings, you know, the, the, um, the commander Sisera into her tent, and uh, instead of sort of just going out into the fields and slaying him in battle right? She has a sort of covert manner of seducing him with, you know, milk curds, which I, I know like today we would be like, like, hey, you want to come over to my place and like get some milk curds? Wait, wait, wait. Is she, <laughs> before we go back to the milk curds, is she in battle beforehand? No. No, she's not at all. So no. she's not on the battlefield. No. Okay. Right. So it is, again, this is sort of like an example of like, it's an example of sort of trickery. But the violence that she does to him, 
um, is so graphic that it's hard to say like, oh, this is covert power. Because once she finally gets him sort of in her, in her hold, right, she, you know, she sticks a, she sticks a peg through his, you know, through his skull, and he, you know, he dies laying at her feet. And, and, and again, feet is a euphemism, right. right? Like between the feet means between the legs, which really means like the sort of genital area. So um, one scholar has actually really interestingly suggested that what we see here with the death of Sisera at the hands of Yael is like a reverse birth scene, right? Where you know, she's giving birth to death um, between her legs and all this blood, right, that he dies there between her legs. Um, so that's sort of um, an interesting, very not domestic picture no. of feminine power. And then if we want to go like even more sort of extreme, we can think about sort of the ancient Near Eastern context in which a lot of these um, characters I think are formed in the literary imagination. So if we think about all the stories of, say for example, the Canaanite goddess Anat, who is, you know, very um, very much engaged in battle. There's one scene in the Canaanite um, Ugaritic epics where she's cutting off the heads of her She's making a necklace out of the heads of you know uh, the people that she slayed Lovely. and a, like a belt of their hands, and, and so th so this is also sort of like a different perspective of feminine power than right. one that we might you know want to see as a kind of like biblical picture, and if we were even to to go even farther down this path and think about just like the array in the ancient Near East of not only sort of goddesses, you know, with power, but also demonesses. And we have um, even a reference to the demoness Lilith in Isaiah. You know, it's a very uh, short mention of her, but it's worth actually saying something because there is an aspect of feminine warrior power that's related and I'm going back to this like story of Yael to childbirth too, oh. right? So it's linked to fertility in this really weird way. So Lilith is this you know, ancient Mesopotamian, becomes an ancient Levantine demoness responsible for um, basically snatching babies and killing them. How would you differentiate between god and demon or goddess and demoness? So a, a demon and a demoness are they are um, transmundane entities, <laughs> like a weird way to say uh -huh. it, but um, that they invade sort of the, the bodily space of others, okay. right? They're sort of like... like possession? Or? There's possession, okay. right? Well, this is sort of a concept of medicine that might seem kind of foreign to us, but it's actually not all that far from germ theory. Right? So like we think about like, like viruses and illnesses that like invade our body and demons and demonesses are like this too. So like in ancient Mesopotamia, they're like responsible for illness. So they invade the body okay. space. And so Lilith as a kind of um, catch all for a, you know, a whole class of demon, demon and demonesses from ancient Mesopotamia becomes this figure who sort of wanders the earth without a family, without a husband, without children, in search of stealing someone else's. Mm. So she steals other people's husbands and causes nocturnal emissions. She steals other people's children, right? Um, so if you think about, you know, demons and demonesses through sort of a concept of characterization and character, um, it can make like a little bit more sense. So we also have, you know, um, in this passage in Isaiah, in the description of a completely desolate land where you think about like sort of a post-apocalyptic space where all kinds of, you know, where it reverts back to wild. I don't know yeah. if you've seen like, you know, when someone like closes down a shopping mall and 10 years later, there's like, all like overgrown with everything. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like that, but worse, you know, with like, you know, all kinds of animals from the wild. And then suddenly you have like Lilith showing up in there because she like the animals of the wild are, is, you know, a figure without a real purpose. So it gives us like a little bit of a picture that 
the authors of these texts were actually living in this thought world, right? For them to include Lilith in a description of how you know an area might revert back to the wild shows us that they actually lived in this thought world that is not separate from sort of the ancient Near Eastern thought mm -hmm. world. And that gender is very much a part of it yeah. and not sort of like a separate thing that like, oh, we have like women characters and we have male characters. It's like, no, I mean, we have, we have power dynamics and ideas of relationships and how they work in sort of paradigmatic yeah. ways. So it's not like you have a gender and then that corresponding profile, but rather these things become fluid. Yes, yeah. and they're not limited to you know, humans, yeah. they sort of imagined on, like, in the religious, if you will, imagination, yeah. right, that they sort of travel in there, too.